it's a it's an immense um, pleasure to have Michael with us, who is a specialist not only in open source hardware matters, but also the legal scholarship on open hardware. So this is the topic for us today. And the reason why we started to do this talk series is because we are going to write a literature review article. Uh, and instead of taking the usual path for writing one, which is just to sit, read a bunch of articles and write a literature review, we, we decided to do this uh, as part of GOSH. So we're basically have an open process where people can read articles and contribute the reviews. And we're going to just have this immense list of, of authors, uh, hopefully. And we're going to review several aspects of open hardware. So uh, just to so you understand the process, we have a thread in the GOSH forum where we're explaining um, the, the process of writing the literature review. And I have one, just one document where you can uh, get started if you want to participate in writing the review. And you can see the initial draft that we started. So to contextualize this process, we started just a few of us, uh, five of us in, in the GOSH community, we started this process of writing the literature review. We dropped the ball. About a year and a half ago, we got really busy and we couldn't continue the work and we decided to um, uh, take the draft and just now, you know, sit and re read everything that has been uh, written uh, of the academic scholarship on the matter and just write the, the literature review. So I'm, I'm going to put up a link here for you. So it's just one link and you will have access to everything that we discussed and you will be able to see the draft that we prepared. Uh, which is going to be helpful if you want to join us in writing uh, this article. If you don't want to write the article, you're more than welcome to join us for this talk series if you're interested in the topics that we're going to cover. And basically, the topics for the talk series are components of the literature review article. So we have the first one with Michael, which is one on the legal scholarship and all the articles that have been uh, written on uh, open licensing, and specifically open licensing concerning open hardware. So we have uh, one link for legal papers. Another component of the, 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 the research article, uh, the literature review article we have, is on social economic and policy uh, research papers. Another one is on educational research. As you know, uh, because of the Arduino phenomena as a platform, we have several papers uh, written for several disciplines on Arduino as a basic tool and, and different uh, educational approaches based on the Arduino uh, for, um, uh, um, platform. We have another uh, topic, which is scientific instrumentation and application which is, again, a very important area of open hardware development. And finally, we have a fifth uh, component, which is commercialization, management, and innovation. So there's quite, there are quite, uh, there is quite a few um, uh, scholars in management and innovation who are interested in the phenomenon of open hardware. So they have been researching and, and publishing articles on this topic. So we're going to review that, that space as well. So uh, many of you have already followed the link. Uh, so please just follow the thread on the GOSH forum to discuss uh, the process with us. And I will stop uh, now and pass on to Michael, who are going to um, um, give uh, his talk. And then we are going to have some time for Q&A. Uh, great, thank you. So uh, I should actually I should say say up front, um, I am not here with a a bunch of literature to present. <laughs> um, I don't I don't have a bunch of sort of a list of scholarship to walk through. Um, what I have done, and that may be my mistake for misunderstanding the assignment, or uh, it may it may be that I want to take this opportunity to kind of raise some of the questions that I think are floating around. Uh, specifically in the legal space with open source hardware and use them as the kind of framework to think about both identifying scholarship that has been done and also identifying spaces where there could be more research. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to talk mostly about questions related to licensing, um, in part because that's kind of a thing that comes up first with people uh, and when, when they think about open source hardware and legal issues. I'm not going to talk at least initially about some of the liability questions that come up. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that I'm actually, I'm happy to talk about that. Oh, good. Uh, I got the assignment right. All right. That's a, that's a good start, right? Um, so, so one of the reasons that I'm going to start with, with a, the licensing issues is because they are generalizable internationally 
in a way that is much less true for the liability questions. Um, you know, it, intellectual property law is not identical across countries, um, but there are, it has been harmonized to a, to a much greater degree than, than any sort of product liability law. So I have to talk about product liability issues and like the main ways to think about those questions. But it seemed useful to start by talking about licensing to identify some of the problems. I see a lot of friends here, a lot of people who who know a lot about this stuff. So um, I'll try and kind of cut to the to the, the deeper part of the chase or however I'm going to destroy that metaphor. Um, but I have, and if it's useful, I have a, a deck, but I don't need the deck. So it's kind of up to um, up to you all if you want me to use slides or just kind of talk. It's all, it's all the, the deck just has a bunch of words that I will then repeat. So um, I can't, I'm not authorized to, to share my screen. I can have you to just continue to not be authorized and just talk or deck. People have strong feelings one way or the other. All right, I'll just talk. <laughs> um, oh, wait, never mind. Deck. Deck is the deck is deck is at least one person has a vote for deck. So uh, if I can be authorized to share my screen. Ah, sorry, I you're will... referring to me. I can authorize you. <laughs> I mean, you know, like whoever has the power, right? You never know. You know, we gotta light the incense and decide who. <laughs> okay. I guess uh... we're all powerless at this point. Right. <laughs> okay. Do you see do you see that option now? Yes, I see that cool. option now. Um, all right, I will select this window. I will do a, do a slideshow. I know how to use Zoom. I've been in the world. Um, okay, and like I said, um, this is a kind of a, a framework. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how these pieces come together and then try and talk about the questions that they raise. Um, cause I know that some people, as I said, some people on this call are, are deep in the legal weeds. Some people are less deep in the legal weeds. So hopefully there's at least moments of, of relevance to the plurality of people on this call. Um, so when we're thinking about open source hardware licensing, um, I find it very useful to think about it in relationship to open source software licensing, right? Because a lot of people in open source hardware are familiar with open source software. And probably more importantly, like a lot of the, the assumptions that people come into open source hardware with are, are informed by their experiences with open source software. Um, and so one really kind of useful set of one construct to keep in mind is this copyright versus patent dichotomy and a born closed versus born open dichotomy. So at a very general level, right? Copyrights and patents are mutually exclusive, right? They're kind of, they're kind of complementary, but they're mutually exclusive. You, if you have a thing and you want to protect it with an intellectual property right, it is either protectable by a copyright or by a patent. And the copyright things are, again, very broadly, creative things, things that you would think of like artists make, uh, you know, paintings or songs or movies or also, you know, novels, also a computer code for historical reasons that we can talk about, but you know, it's all, it's all in there. Um, and then, then there's the patent world and the patent world is the kind of useful functional world, the kind of thing that you'd expect engineers to make uh, on a daily basis. Now, obviously, especially in a kind of gosh world, we know that the, the distinction between those two things is not <laughs> particularly strong, but imagine it at a fairly kind of Imagine you're a, a 70 year old judge trying to think about the world. Like this is this is the way that you sort you sort things. Um, and an important feature of that distinction is this idea of born closed versus born open. So copyright protection, if you make a thing that is categorically eligible for copyright protection, right? If you take a photograph or you write a novel or you write an email, that's a kind of thing that gets protected by copyright and it's protected automatically the minute it is created. So by existing, it is created. When it is born, it is born protected by copyright and it is, therefore it is born closed. If you want to share it with someone else, if you wanna give permission to someone to remix it or build upon it or do whatever they want with it, you have to take an active step to open it up. The entire kind of framework of open source software is built around this idea that it is born closed and you need to take steps to open it up. 
Now for patent things, for functional things, for useful things, patents aren't automatic, right? If you create a new airplane, it is not automatically protected by patent the minute it's created. You have to take a bunch of steps to uh, file a patent application, convince the patent office that you qualify for a patent, pay a bunch of money, do a bunch of things. So you can take steps to close your useful invention, your engineering invention. But when it's born, it's born open. If you do nothing, then anyone can do whatever they want with it. You don't have to take any kind of affirmative action or do anything to make that happen. And this distinction is really important when we think about open source software and open source hardware and what is born closed and what is born open. So we think about open source software, right? Open source software is born closed, right? The moment it is written it is protected by copyright. If you wanna share it with somebody, you have to do something. And the way that we have developed to do that is we've used legal licenses, right? Legal licenses are permission to say, okay, in the absence of a license, I wrote this code. If you copied it, you would be infringing on my copyright and I could sue you. But I'm going to give you a license. I'm going to give you permission to say, no, you can copy. I'm going to, uh, you are allowed to copy my software. And so I'm taking a step to open it up. But there's a catch. A lot of open source software licenses leverage that fact that you need permission to force downstream users to do something, right? It gives the creators control over how downstream users use the software. So you think about, you know, like GPL is a, is a classic example of saying, I wrote this software, I'm opening it up, but you have to, if you use it and you build on it, you have to be open to, right? I'm going to force obligations on you and I can force them on you because if you fail to follow my rules, if you don't follow my license, you're infringing on my copyright and I can sue you. And so, you know, people who are fans of the GPL think that that, that, that power is being used for good. But it is a power of control that all flows back to the fact that software is born closed. And so other people need permission in order to legally use it. Hardware is a, bit, is a much more complicated situation. There are parts of hardware that are born closed, right? The software, a lot of hardware has software. Software, born closed, protected by copyright, need to think about licenses. Uh, documentation, right? We talked about how like novels and emails most documentation that's also going to be protected by copyright, uh, also going to be born closed. Non-functional decorative elements, right? The parts of the hardware that don't do the thing, but just kind of look nice. Those are probably also born closed. But there's going to be a lot of hardware and a lot of pieces on hardware that is like, it's functional, right? It does the thing that you want the hardware to do. That's probably in that patent category. That's probably born open. Now you could spend a bunch of money to, and time to get a patent to then openly license it, right? And you kind of like do a full expensive circle. <laughs> but in the absence of taking a bunch of steps, it's born open. Now on one hand, it's like, that's amazing, right? Like we, we can sidestep this entire drama of open source software and licensing and just say, it's actually, it's open, it's born open, it's totally fine. Um, but the other complication there is that means you also don't get the ability as a creator to impose obligations on users, at least for part of it. And so this is like a complicating factor when we think about licensing and open source hardware. And so there are other complications that flow from this, right? So we think about like, okay, you know, open source software licenses, maybe we'll just use it for everything um, and try and make it work. Um, but open source software licenses are written for software. And like the, the, the framework that the people who wrote them were thinking about was software. And, you know, parts of that framework might apply to hardware, but parts of it might not. <laughs> and so you get kind of weird, how do you interpret these terms in, in the license issues? Um, you have this problem, as I mentioned, in hardware, where it's like parts of the hardware might need to be licensed for someone to use, but other parts aren't, and they don't need to be licensed. And it's not obvious. It's not easy to kind of identify from for any individual piece of hardware which which parts are what. <laughs> um, and so you know, while it's easy to give a rule of thumb for software, right? For software, you need a license. 
for hardware, it's a little bit like, well, it depends on the hardware and what's going on, which is not super useful if you have a universe of people who don't want to spend their time becoming like intellectual property lawyers, right? Which is a good, probably a good choice for society. Um, you also have this sort of asymmetric rights assumption problem. So if you are a user of open source hardware, and you want to be the like kind of most conservative legal approach you can, even though any piece of hardware, some parts will be open, some parts will be closed, some parts will be a license, some people, some parts won't need a license. The like safest assumption, this isn't necessarily the right assumption, but this is the most conservative assumption you can have, is that you need a license to do anything, right? Because you're not sure where the lines are. And so it's safest to sort of look for the license and be constrained by the license. But if you're a creator of open hardware, you need to know that whatever license you use, whatever obligations, if you want to impose obligations on future users, you may not be fully empowered to legally enforce those obligations. So you have to assume that people can actually ignore your licenses in some cases. And so for users, you're kind of overly deferential to licenses. And for creators, you are underconfident <laughs> in your licenses. And that asymmetry creates uh, a, a kind of tension. And it also creates a, the potential for this norm of over licensing, right? This norm of saying, well, you know, just to be safe, we don't know, I may, I may have a right in this, I may not have a right in this. I'm not sure. Just to be safe, I'm going to throw a license on it. And on some way, well, that's good, right? Because like, there's a license there, it's clear, it's fine. But what it does, it is it sets this expectation that like everything needs a license, even though there's an entire world of things that don't need a license at all. And I think it's actually dangerous in the long term for for open advocates broadly to set expectations that you have to over that everything needs a license. And so this is a I think this is a complication. Um, so what kind of what kind of solutions can there be? Here's a bunch of imperfect solutions. They're not. They're not great. They don't, they don't solve all the problems, but they're like they're interesting and they're worth thinking about. Um, one is, and this is actually an approach we use for the for the Oshawa certification that I'll talk about briefly. Um, and I see there's a chat, there's a question in the chat. I want to um, oh, so yeah, so Javier, who is like the real expert on this, I'm gonna I'm gonna embarrass myself in front of him. Um, ask when I say hardware, do I mean a tangible hardware or hardware design files or both? Yeah, sorry, this is actually a nomenclature problem that I always struggle with. In this case, when I'm usually when I'm saying hardware, I mean like the entire package of the hardware. I mean the physical objects, I mean the code, I mean the documentation, I mean all the files, I mean kind of that entire package. Um, I'll try and be more specific that when I when I'm talking about just the physical hardware to identify that more specifically. Because and this is this is both a, a legal complication and a nomenclature complication, right? There's like not a good word. We, when we were thinking about the certification, we struggle with this. Like, is it the hardware? Is it the, are we certifying like the project, the product, the, the thing? Um, it's just, it's, I don't know. It's, it's a shortcoming of English. One of the many shortcomings of English. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'll, so I'll try to be more specific about that. So one option to kind of deal with this is to try and patch together existing licenses for kind of what works, right? So you, know, you might say, and we use this, this is one of the kind of, this is the framework that we use for the certification process for Oshawa, sort of. Um, you say, okay, well, we've got software in this hardware, in, my, in this hardware package. <laughs> and so open source software licenses are written for software. Uh, use that, use the, the open source software license for software. And you've got this documentation and these decorative elements um, for that are also kind of classic Creative Commons y kinds of things. And so you can use a Creative Commons license to license those. And then maybe you can use, like for the hardware, if it's not protected by anything, maybe you use nothing. Uh, maybe you kind of wave your hand and say, well, the, the open source software licenses and the Creative Commons licenses kind of extend if it matters, kind of not. The, the upside of this is that it uses kind of brands people know. <laughs> and we'll talk about the kind of communicative power of, of hardware, of licensing in a second. Um, the downside is it's it sort of, it creates these like weird, there, there's room in the joints and there's potentially spaces, potentially not. And you have all the other problems I mentioned before. 
Um, so other, another option is, is these hardware omni licenses. Um, and these are licenses that are that are attempting to license like the whole hardware package. Um, and so solder pad and taper were the earliest were early ones. Uh, the the ones that I you know Javier is here on the line, so he will um, I will embarrass him and say that like you know CERN I think the CERN 2.0 hardware licenses are the most mature and are the the best hardware licenses, and they are designed to kind of wrap the entire package. Uh, the newest versions have these flavors that are that you can like conceptually map to other open software licenses, so if you kind of know what they are uh, socially, it helps. Um, but I think they all they they, they and I, I think that you know the CERN folks would 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 talk about this as well, right? They also have this this problem where they all can only license what you have, and they don't license what you know any rights you don't have. And as a casual user, it can be hard to identify what what is like what is licensed and what is bound, and like how obligated you are, how obligated you really are to be open or to to, to do all the things that the, that the licenses require. Um, and then this third option, and this is something that I, that I think this is one of the things I, I would love for people to spend. I, I would love for people to spend more time thinking about. I spend a lot of time thinking about it. Um, is to kind of begin to separate out the sort of license as law and license as social signal concept, right? One of the things that happened in open source software, because software is born closed and the licenses were so legally important, is they also became socially totemic, right? People use, you know, there are plenty of people who have open source software who use an open source software license and it would never, and they would tell you, they would never sue someone for infringement. And one of the reasons that they are using that license is it's a way to kind of communicate a social preference to users and efficiently say, hey, uh, I'm sharing this with you. And what I want you to do is attribute it to me or be open when what you when when you build on it. Um, now again, there are plenty of people who who think this as, as legally enforceable rules, but there's a layer of social signaling, and in open source software, those things are compressed. But open source hardware, in some ways, creates an opportunity to separate them out, and to think about using different tools for those different roles. Um, you know, it's impossible for me to talk about this stuff and not talk a little bit about the certification that, that Ashwa does. Um, I won't talk a lot about it, but I, I will say that like this is a, this is an attempt to kind of juggle some of these problems. Um, the certification plays a number of roles. It's a free pro program that Ashwa runs. Uh, you can apply for certification, and if Ashwa Ashwa basically reviews your hardware, makes sure that your documentation and and your licensing complies with the open hardware definition. And then gives you a license to a logo that allows you to clearly communicate to people that when I say open source hardware, uh, I mean that I meet this definition. This solves a lot of this potentially solves a lot of problems. Um, but one of two of the primary functions for the purposes of this conversation is it does create a way to kind of identify common expectations for open source hardware, right? What it means to be adequately documented, what it means to be adequately licensed, licensed. And then also it acts as a, a kind of documentation and licensing compliance program for users, right? If you are creating open source hardware and you're not sure if you've done everything you need to do, and people do this all the time, you can submit it and it's, you know, it's free and the team will look at it. And if there are problems, they will come back to you. They will email you and say, hey, you know, it looks, this is a neat looking project, but it looks like you don't have any licenses at all, or it looks like you're missing documentation. And you can go back and forth with them to kind of get the package to where it needs to be for you know for the conversation and, and to and to to work within the open source hardware ecosystem. So what happens next, right? This is uh, this all this is in some ways has been a kind of long wind up to say this is where we you know more study is needed, right? <laughs> These are the questions that that I I am I don't think we have adequate answers to, right? There are these, these sort of fundamental questions in terms of like users and how they operate, right? What licenses are people using? Now we have data about this because the certification asks those, those questions. And there's an API for the certification database. Like you can hit it today, you can download it and you can look at it. Uh, but we, we have a short, I will admit, we have a shortage of analysis on what people are actually doing and what it means. 
we do have some information. We also, there are, there are kind of social questions about what creators think licenses do when they attach them to their open source hardware and what users think licenses do when they see them on open source hardware. And, and in some ways, one of the reasons that we don't have more information about this is that there haven't been enough high profile fights in open source hardware. There have been fights. They're all, you know, there's always fights. Um, but real, real fights about expectation management and misalignments is where you see answers to these questions, where there's like a con where there's a real conflict between a creator who used a license one way and a user who engaged with the hardware in another way and thinks that the license allowed them to do it or they could ignore the license or whatever it is. So I think this is something that we're going to learn more and more about. And again, like we do see conflicts and they um, conflicts are usually bad, but I think they do illuminate a little bit where the expectation mismatches can be. Um, and those can be places where we then as a community can come in and see what tools we can develop to improve that problem and avoid that, that mismatch in the future, potentially. Um, and then there's this last thing that, you know, I'm, I'll mention a second time. And this is, I think, a real opportunity for open source hardware is thinking about breaking out the legal and social roles of licenses. And deciding if we as a community want to continue to rely on legal structures to be doing the social work of explaining to each other how we expect hardware to be used, that we contribute to the commons. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we talked about this, this idea called um, disclaim and request. And so this is this idea where uh, it would be like a Creative Commons E logo. And the first part of it, the disclaim part, would be a CC0 public domain dedication. We were like, look, this is hardware. The rights are complicated. It's like, it's really messy. So to the extent that I have any rights in any of this, I'm going to waive all of them and dedicate it all to the public domain. So I'm going to disclaim any rights I have. But then I'm going to request, right, in a, in a standardized way, not a legally enforceable way, but in, just in the same way that like you see a, 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 you know, a Creative Commons share alike icon, right? You know what that means as a social matter in addition to a legal matter. And say, okay, well, we're gonna, I'm gonna disclaim and say CC0 and then request that you share alike or request that you don't create derivatives or request that you know whatever other terms you wanna use. And one of the reasons I thought that was an interesting idea is because it, it explicitly kind of separated out the legal enforceability of that request from the social weight of the request. Um, since then, there have been other, in, in other areas, there are, there's a set of um, what are called, they're called traditional knowledge labels, TK labels. These are used in open access uh, contexts in, in the kind of glam context where you have indigenous knowledge that is being shared as part of a larger open access program um, it's a way to kind of bring cultural context, non-legally binding cultural context into these cultural artifacts. And to say, hey, uh, this is a song in this community, in the source community, it was only sung by women. And so it, it shouldn't be sung by men. Um, I'm gonna communicate that information to you with these traditional knowledge labels. I can't sue you if you decide <laughs> you're gonna have like a men's choir sing it, but you at least know in a way that's easy to understand what the kind of cultural expectation is. And I think there's a lot of room for experimentation in thinking about separating out the social signals because you know there is some benefit to tying the legal and the social together. But I think there, that, that comes at some cost. And I don't know that we should blindly follow the, the example of open source software and in the open source hardware community. Um, so anyway, those are, that's like some stuff about licensing and open source hardware. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, Glam is, yes. So these are like, you know, if you're a, a, a museum that has a collection of items, uh, especially a collection of items taken from an indigenous community that is not particularly well represented in your institution <laughs> and you wanna make them available, 
um, the traditional knowledge labels are a mechanism to kind of engage with the source community and try and, and connect to that community with, with people who might find the artifacts, um, you know, in your digital collection or elsewhere. So I don't know, that's some, that's the kind of the licensing part of it. Like I said, I, I didn't talk about the liabilities part, which, which often is the kind of second legal conversation. Um, and there's also, a, we can have a conversation about um, trademarks and branding, which actually I, I think are in some ways the most important part of open source hardware from a legal standpoint, but I'll stop talking and uh, yeah. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, um, for sharing um, your experience on, on the legal matters with us. That's an excellent um, um, opportunity for us to debate things that we have always been asking about uh, open hardware licensing and the, you know, the things that we still need to figure out in the space. Uh, you got the assignment totally um, right in the sense that you uh, we asked you to get us started um, in thinking about the things that are not very clear in the space and opportunities for further research. And this is what we want to do uh, collectively. So that's excellent. Thank you so much. So let's have questions now. Let's open the floor for questions. I have a few, but I want, uh, of course, open to everyone who might want to ask questions to Michael. Well, go ahead, Harris. I think you should be able to unmute yourself, but let me know if you can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, I'm taking the first question. I'm perhaps the least knowledgeable person, um, newbie, like the most newbie in the community. I'd like, in that I have understood the last from the talk, perhaps, but I'd like to stick to the last slide about separating, uh, severing the links between the legal and the social. Um, aspects of licensing. I think this should definitely happen uh, in order to uh, protect, and correct me if this doesn't exist, what I'm going to describe, to protect a sort of ethos of sharing, like a culture of sharing, uh, and sort of like, uh, I had to pull at some point in open hardware where it was like this conception of democracy based on sharing and like, you know, hey, you didn't have this, you know, it's fine. Uh, and building on humane, uh, non, let's say legalistic, for lack of a better word, like non-corporate relationships, collegi collegial relationships. So I, I would be all for, it, it might, the legal aspect might have started at a time when you had big companies, things were less clear, communities like were more were more suspicious of each other because perhaps there was like they were taking advantage of those who were sharing stuff. So I think now it should, and as I said, correct me if I've misunderstood many things, which is entirely possible. It would be perhaps even necessary to create, to maintain this ethos in the community, which brought us also together to like. Hey, let's you know, let's be humans. Let's do a project. Let's work together. Which for me is something very important within the open software and hardware movement, and I'm all, and science more generally, open science and citizen science movement. Okay, that's it. Yeah, I think it's a sort of a quick reaction. I mean, I think it's a, it's a really good point and a really kind of healthy way to think about. Way, I think brings brings a lot of people to this community, me myself included, right? This excitement of a of a humane community of people kind of acting uh, altruistically in a lot of ways. Um, one way I sometimes think about this is, you know, whether or not you're designing your system for for good actors or for bad actors, and that that's not a binary system, right? It's a it's a it's a spectrum. But this idea of like very often lawyer, and I, I say this, I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I can say this, right? I mean, anyone can say it, but um, like lawyers often design systems for bad actors. Say, so how can we stop bad actors from being bad? Um, and I think it, it's, especially in this context, it may be better to think about designing for good actors, right? And say, okay, if you have a good actor, what do you, what do they need 
in order to be able to do what you want them to do, right? Assume they want to do what, they, what, you, what you want them to do. And the, there is a kind of legal element of that, right? You need to give them the licensing that they need to do what they want to do. Um, but you also need to kind of communicate your wishes to them in a way that's easy for them to understand because you assume that they want to follow them. And so just like thinking about that framework as a designing for good actors instead of designing for bad actors yeah. um, can sometimes help. Yeah, if I may just have a second, it, that would be a real revolution and something like, you know, a wider, something that the world needs, like in general, like, and could be, yeah, I'll stop there. All right, Nico, do you want to go ahead? Hi. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Am I audible? Yep, you're good. Oh, thanks. Well, thanks, Michael, for the chat. It's been really interesting. And I was wondering, um, but in my context, I'm not sure if I'm sharing my project under, I don't know, uh, the CERN OHLS license, but I have no intention of patenting anything really <laughs> because it's so much work and also I don't have the money so is it so this this usage of the license I see, if I understood correctly is more of a social thing because it's not protected and by patent law right uh, is that correct so this is where you get a little bit of a kind of lawyerly it's complicated answer right so depending on your hardware there may be parts of your hardware that are protected by copyright law. And so, you know, if, again, if there's code, um, for, you know, if there's documentation, maybe the schematics and the source files, we could have a whole side conversation about that. Um, and so I think it is it, on balance, it is good to use the license because to the extent that you have stuff that is protected by copyright, and you want someone to use it, you need to use the license to give them permission. At the same time, you need to be realistic about what kind of rules you can make users operate under, right? If you, if you choose the, the, you know, the, the CERN license that is sort of GPL-like, right? That is trying to force users to be open if they use your stuff you need to understand that there may be ways for people to use your stuff and ignore your license because they're not using the code or they're not using the documentation, right? They're just using the functional elements. Um, and so it's this weird, this is, this is kind of the asymmetry I was, I was trying to touch on before where it's still, I mean, first of all, it's still good to kind of to use a license to clear up any ambiguity and any, and any rights you might have. Second, like you said, it is useful as a social signal to be telling people who want to follow your wishes what you want them to do. But third, you need to be realistic about how enforceable those wishes are. Because if you build an entire framework around the assumption that you can enforce those rules on anyone who uses your hardware, you may be disappointed if someone comes in and ignores your rules and can work around the legal license part of it. I know that's like, it's like a lot floating around there. I, this is like the hardest thing for, for me and I think for everybody to kind of get their mind around when it comes to uh, open hardware and licensing. <laughs> so I apologize if, that's, if it's confusing, but if it is confusing, it's partially because you are understanding it. It's like music lessons. Okay, great. Thank you, Michael. It's like we, in, the, in the US, music licensing is, is super complicated. And so what people say is, you know, if, if you're learning it, the moment you stop and say, wait, this can't be right, that's the moment you understand. <laughs> right. Who else uh, wants to ask questions to Michael? Does anyone want to ask another question? No. Well, I have a couple of questions. Nico, do you want to ask something else? Yeah, I can, I can touch briefly on a couple other things too, if, if there's no other questions, or I can just let everyone go or whatever. I think Nico <laughs> just raised his. Yeah, I, I have, a, I don't know how applicable uh, this conversation is to other countries. I don't know how, how 
I'm, for example, I don't know, I'm in Argentina, and besides a lot of cultural differences, there must be also legal differences, right? So I really, my question really is, what's the like the happiest or least, uh, least concern? I, I mean, sorry, uh, what's the happiest expectation I can have um, with respect of using these licenses? I mean, um, What's the happiest used uses and expectations right now for using these these licenses? Yeah, I mean, I think the maybe I don't know if it's good news or not, but the the, the news is that the the basic rules around copyright and around patent law and kind of how they work and where the lines are between them is pretty standardized internationally. So this framework that we're talking about here. To the kind of to a first approximation applies on in almost every country. Um, there are going to be little exceptions and things around the corner, but as a kind of way to think about it. Um, and so, in terms of like the best outcome, I don't know, you know, Javier, you probably have thoughts about this. But in terms of the, the best outcome, I think the best outcome is you use the license and you remove any blockers, legal blockers, for someone to be able to use your hardware in new ways, right? And people, because people are always like, well, I'll just throw it, it's open source because I'll just like put it on the internet and it's fine. And I think, you know, in many cases that's that's true, but it doesn't take very far down the road of usage where somebody asks some legal question. And so by taking the step and putting the license on, you are eliminating a barrier. You're removing a barrier that will, that will probably kind of appear in the future to someone who wants to use the hardware in the spirit that you are contributing it to the commons. Um, I don't know, you know, Javier, you, you probably have a better better thought on that than I do. Uh, yes, I, I, um, I, I wanted to say that when we when we wrote the license, there is, of course, as you mentioned very well, this, there is an underlying assumption, which is that the design documents, the, the, the schematics, the layouts, uh, the mechanical CAD files, um, enjoy some kind of protection. Okay, it doesn't need to be copyright. It, it can be something else in other countries. You know, we always talk only about copyright, but the license themselves don't, don't don't make any assumptions on the underlying rights. And there are countries which have design rights and other things that could cover uh, things like schematics. Also, um, in our experience as designers, you know, we do both hardware and software. And uh, the process is very, very similar. And uh, some even some of the design flows, the modern design flows uh, for some of the hardware are even text-based, which makes it even more similar to software. Uh, so uh, there is this underlying assumption that there is some kind of protection in your design files. This is why I asked the question, because we always talk about design files, basically. We, we don't talk about the actual tangible hardware. Uh, I also agree. I also agree with you that the main um, uh, the main objective that you achieve by using the licenses is sending a message uh, of the type of sharing that you expect. And I also agree that um, uh, you, you should be careful with your expectations, especially for the reciprocal licenses uh, as to, to which extent they would be enforceable and to which extent people have to feedback improvements, et cetera, in different uh, contexts. Our experience, uh, however, is that um, people go by these rules, uh, even including commercial companies, uh, probably because they think it's less risky or, and, and also because there's no point in contributing to a community if you're not going to um, respect the these kind of social rules that people expect you to respect. So, so um, I, I agree with you, Michael. It's a complex uh, thing. The, the, the license is trying to achieve many things, uh, the, some of them social, some of them legal. Um, you said you didn't talk about uh, liability, but there's also a, a part of the license that deals with that. So, um, Yes, all, all in all, I, I would not be opposed to pursuing this, this idea of um, splitting the social expectations from the legal side of things. Uh, today, the, the licenses that we use are, are doing both kind of at the same time. Um, but yeah, um, uh, all I can say is in practice, it works. It, uh, for, for, for the reasons I said, uh, we have 
been using the three sharing regimes uh, in different projects. So permissive, weakly reciprocal, and strongly reciprocal. And people take them seriously, both um, in academia and in, um, in corporate environments. Um, but as you said, if you're starting, if you're going to start building uh, something that you um, heavily depend on, for example, economically with high stakes uh, and so on, then you should think twice uh, before relying on a very, very specific behavior that you expect from the users of, of your designs. Uh, but basically, yeah, the, the main thing I wanted to say is that the license is for the designs. And then um, the, the way it kicks in when it wants to enforce obligations for things like sharing back is that uh, in modern manufacturing and uh, of hardware, very, very often you transfer files from um, your computer to a manufacturing machine and you do things that you would otherwise not be allowed to do. Uh, so that's, oh, there's also an, an FAQ entry in the CERN OHL uh, wikis that explains that not every kind of design is as well suited as, as others for, for this kind of license. So this is uh, for relatively complex designs that involve some kind of automated manufacturing where files are copied around. And um, that's where the obligations kick in because there's an assumption that people would not have the right to do those things, in particular copy files, if they don't have your permission. Um, for the permissive variant of the license, of course, things are much simpler. And um, it's mostly a statement of, uh, you know, clarifying that you're just giving these to people to do basically whatever they want with it. So uh, we have time for probably one or two questions. Um, so I have a question about this split uh, between the social and the legal, which I find I, I I would like to ask you to talk more about this, Michael. But I guess it this this topic is so complex that I think we might have to push to the next meeting, which is on Monday. And here's the. <laughs> you know, the shameless plug. So on Monday, same time, 3 p.m., we're going to be talking for one hour about the social, the economic, and the policy uh, research on this. Um, and this is a fascinating question because uh, the separation, it seems that, uh, that there's a truism that we usually say that you don't start a community by decree, right? <laughs> so there's a lot that happens and really happens in the open hearted community by the moral and the social ties that we build. Even when it comes to the obligations we have in terms of manufacturing a project, sometimes things fall on the moral responsibilities that we have and not so much on the licensing. So I think when you say, uh, you talk about the risk of over uh, licensing, uh, this is something that we, I think many of us uh, already experienced and, and are very aware of this. And, and we might not have enough uh, debate about this uh, because that we have a big emphasis on licensing, which is fundamental, but there are a lot of things that we need to address as well as a community. So putting that aside, because we won't be able to talk about this, could you uh, talk to us about some of the more recent uh, litigation cases? Uh, this is something that I think many of us are interested in. And many of us in the community are most familiar with like uh, classic cases like Stratasys versus uh, MakerBot. Um, but uh, if you have recent cases of litigation, um, if you could share with us an analysis that that would be helpful as we move um, to the process of drafting the, the literature review. Yeah, I mean, I guess the the you know the, the good news, the, the mixed news is I don't actually don't have a bunch of I do not have a bunch of examples to give you of like full blown litigation, um, and this is actually maybe not a surprise because there aren't that many examples of litig of real litigation in open source software. Um, it's actually it's a you, you might call it under litigated. If you were a lawyer, you would call it under litigated space. Uh, oh, I think no. it's for the best. Um, you do get you do get you know. Uh, nasty blog posts. You do get nasty grams every once in a while. You get people kind of sniping at each other. Um, but we haven't seen a lot of these things litigated. And I think that that is, you know, to Javier's point, um, a reflection of the fact that more often than not, if, you, if, you, if you're close enough to one of these communities to be engaged with this, um, you're inclined to, to follow the rules. Um, you know, we, there were examples... It's like a weird situation during 
the first year of COVID where people were um, getting design patents on like PPE and stuff like that. And uh, like, as far as I know, they, they never enforced them. I don't know if they were enforceable. I think it was mostly a kind of stunt uh, by the PR department of various universities to do that sort of thing. Um, and there are conflicts, you know, I mean, there's the, you know, all, the, all the Arduino conflict stuff, which you may or may not think about as open source hardware. Um, but I, I think it's it's remarkably light. The, the thing that I think is probably most important is not the kind of patent fights that you saw, the kind of Stratasys maker bot, uh, we've got a gun under the under the table kind of things. Um, but more of the trademark things. I'm saying, look, this is open source hardware. Anybody, anybody can make it, but we don't share our trademark. And so if you see our name on hardware, it's not just our design, but it's our physical manufacturer. And wanting to protect the integrity of, of the trademark, of the name that you hold back from sharing so that people who see that name on hardware can trust the full manufacturing chain is something that I think is most important. I, you know, when when I get emails from people who are concerned about knockoffs um, for, in the open source hardware context, it's that trademark problem that is that is almost always most urgent, um, and it's really important, right? Like it matters who makes your hardware, right? You know, I, you know, I design, I download a design from the internet. Um, someone else designed, downloads the exact same, you know, digital, I like was saying like digital file from the internet. Um, we both manufacture it. Those physical objects are going to be probably very different, right? Mine's, mine's going to be garbage. Hopefully the other person has done a better job. Um, but so being able to kind of reliably identify the people responsible for make, not just designing, but making the hardware, that's the role of trademark. And that is one area that becomes, it's like, it's the closed part of open hardware that makes open hardware work, right? It's like the flux capacitor of open hardware. It's like these closed trademarks sometimes. Okay. And then Veronica, we have Javier and... Uh, yes, I just wanted to say that we are very much exploring this as well um, uh, as part of our investigations on how to have um, good communities around hardware designs. And um, one thing that we are trying to see is if we can um, if we can um, get the best of both worlds in terms of open source and technology transfer in universities and in, in public labs. And um, to make projects sustainable, we, we, we would like to have uh, structures like collaborations where people show up and they uh, contribute uh, financially for the sustainability of the project. And they come to this collaboration uh, for a number of reasons. And uh, one of them can be uh, the ability to use uh, a trademark logo which is, uh, you know, it's, it would be one of the incentives, especially for some corporate actors, uh, but there's others like uh, testing, compliance, education, courses, etc. cetera. So um, yeah, trademark for us is one of the tools that we are exploring in, in the um, making of, you know, good communities, sustainable communities around designs. Yeah, Veronica. Uh... Hi, uh, Michael, thank you so much for the great talk. I like what you just said really spoke to me. I, I am conducting a field work with an open hardware organization in Mexico. They work very closely with Arduino. They provide uh, certain supporting services in this part of the world for Arduino. And what I have noticed too is how important is the trademark uh, for open hardware uh, businesses uh, and how then supply chains and kind of like geographies of production who, that are connected to how a trademark is produced become even more important in the narrative of the brand, in how you position a brand, in how you even discuss issues of technological sovereignty, which is the focus of my research especially in Latin America. So yeah, I, I was just gonna speak to my own experience on the field work this past month and how that resonates with what you just said. <laughs> mm 
Oop, you're muted, Michael, um, if you're trying to respond. Yes. Amateur hour over here. Um, Daniel <laughs> in the chat, you mentioned. So first of all, absolutely. <laughs> Second of all, uh, Daniel in the chat, you mentioned the kind of um, ethical uh, uh, obligations. This is something that's mm -hmm. actually very active right now in open source licensing generally. Uh, these ethical open source licenses, um, it's, it is, it is. some people think it is contrary to the core concept of open source. Mm -hmm. uh, other people think that maybe it's time to, to think more creatively. Um, the ethical source license is a, is a great kind of place that that is happening. We put together an ethical license for uh, this software package called ML5JS. That's a machine learning uh, library associated with processing. Um, but there's, yeah, it is, this is very much a thing that is, is happening right now. If there, if you can think of something as being kind of cool, cool and open source licensing, uh, ethical open source licenses is like a hot topic in, in open source licensing. <laughs> okay, well, we've got probably less than a minute left. So um, I'm going to go ahead and close out the session. But thank you, everyone, so much for participating and for the great discussion. Um, there, as, as Luis Felipe mentioned earlier, the next one will be on Monday at the same time, and you can find that information on that same forum on the GOSH forum. Um, so thank you all, um, and hopefully Michael. see you on Monday. Thank you, Michael. Thanks thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Bye. Thanks, Michael. Bye. Hopefully see you on Monday. Bye. Yes. Cool. Um, I, I took notes, by the way. I'll like clean them up, but if you want to see them, oh, cool. you can share them. Awesome. Yeah, yeah that's really cool. Cool. Um, I'm going to stop.